Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Feinstein, and this is my next video. At the end of the last video, I let us know that we were going to be going over this book next, which is a nice little book written by Mark Dever called What is a Healthy Church? I know the, the last uh, four lessons that I did were on a very complicated subject, biblical theology, and so I figured for the next few I would keep it light. We would hit some practical matters, and very few things are more practical than what is a healthy church. I mean, during this time of COVID-19 where people are sheltering in place and and as a church we're not gathering together, um, I think it's it's very important for us to understand a practical ecclesiology. In other words, practically, what does it mean to be the church? And uh, what is a good church? What is a healthy church? What is a biblical church? Uh, because there's a lot out there that are not good, that are not healthy. In fact, the vast majority are not. Okay, so this is the perfect book to go over. First question that gets posed in this book is, what are you looking for in a church? Far too often, we hear all the wrong answers, right? Well, I'm looking for a church where people are around my age, uh, with kids around my age, where we're at the same uh, stage, or I'm looking for a church where people have the same hobbies as me, or I'm looking for a place where I could just feel like I could be myself and like I belong, or I'm looking for a church where the music style is my style. And if you notice, all those are about me, 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 my, my, my. And I'll tell you, None of, none of those reasons that are typically given uh, are in any way biblical, right? It's, you know, when, when we ask the question, what should you be looking for in a church? The answer should be, I am looking for a church that is biblical, a church that honors and glorifies God. Okay, so then we have to ask ourselves, what does a biblical church look like? Now, before we get into the idea of what is a healthy church, uh, Mark Dever spends a, a little bit of time addressing the common trend in our society where a lot of people think they don't need the church. You know, in our society, <coughs> excuse me, we focus so much on our individual relationship with Jesus, that salvation is about me having a personal relationship with Jesus, that, that we start to act like the church is just optional. As long as I got Jesus, I don't need the church. And there's nothing that could be further from the truth. I mean, that's not even a biblical idea. We are not just saved as individuals. I mean, that's part of it. But you were saved as a people, as a covenant community. God made the new covenant with a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. He covenanted to save the people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. So you are part of a people. It's not just about you. Not only that, you were saved into a kingdom. And you're to be serving that kingdom. And so if you think about it from the standpoint of, oh, it's just my personal relationship with Jesus, you don't even understand the gospel. Yes, you do have a personal relationship with him, but that's not all, not by a long shot, okay? So first thing we need to think about when we think about this idea of can I be a Lone Ranger Christian is what does it even mean to be a Christian? What is a Christian? Well, a Christian is somebody who is reconciled to God. And so think about what that means. You were at enmity with God, okay? You were uh, an enemy of God because of your sin. You were a rebel. God is holy. He's an all-consuming fire. He should destroy you because of your sin. But because God is a loving God, he sent the God-man, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, into his own creation to live a perfectly righteous life, since we failed to do that, and then to die as our substitute on the cross, taking the penalty we deserve for us. That way, God could dismiss the penalty against you because Jesus volunteered to pay, pay your debt in your place. So he dies. He raises, and then he ascends to the Father. And, and so in so doing, when you believe on him, okay, you have the swapping of accounts. He paid your debt. He gives you his righteousness. Okay, you're declared righteous, and you are now reconciled with God. You are at peace with God, which is an amazing reality, right? And so in that sense, yes, it is individual. But understand this. You are not just reconciled to God. As God reconciles you to himself, he also reconciles you to his people. Okay, God has always had a people, 
Okay, whether it was Adam and then Seth and then Noah and then Abraham and then Israel and now the new covenant community where it's people of every nation, tribe, and tongue. God has a people. He has a covenant community. And and so not only does he reconcile you to himself, he reconciles you to everybody else he has reconciled, right? And so think about it. Think about the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, one, you can't love your neighbor as you love yourself if you have nothing to do with him, right? And so from the standpoint of the covenant community of God, I've been reconciled to God. I've been reconciled to all of his people. And now we exist together as a community of believers who are supposed to love one another right? In fact, 1 John chapter 3 says, we know we have passed from death into life because we love the brothers. That means if you don't love the brothers, you have not passed from death into life. You are still dead spiritually. You are still, if you're not reconciled to God's people, you're not reconciled to God. So you might be saying, well, you're saying that I have to go to church to be saved. No, those who are saved go to church. Those who are saved are connected to a a local assembly. If you have nothing to do with the bride of Christ, yes, you are not saved. But it's not because you don't go to church. It's because you're just not saved. Uh, If you were saved, then one of the fruits of that is that you would be connected with a local fellowship of believers. It's that simple. We are saved to be part of a people. Listen, the idea of God reconciling us to himself and to each other is very clear. The first half of Ephesians chapter 2 is all about God reconciling us to him. But then after verse 10, verse 11, all the way to the end of the chapter, then talks about us being reconciled to each other. Jews and Gentiles were separated, but the wall has been knocked down, and now we are one people. One what? One people. It says we are one commonwealth. We're one people. We're being fashioned into one temple. So how can you be a people, a commonwealth, and a temple when you're a lone ranger? When you're disconnected from those, the people, the temple, uh, and the household. In fact, it calls us the household of God, which means family. You, you might get annoyed with people at the church. Well, you get annoyed with people in your family. Do you disown them as your family? No, they're your family. You, you bear with them until, until you're dead. Well, same thing with the church, okay? So a person who thinks they don't need a church is a person who does not know Christ yet, or they're just in sin right now, and the Lord is going to work on them and get them to repent of it. But if they never repent of it, um, I, you know, based on what the scriptures say, that they're, they're not part of the people of God, right? So that being said, what is a healthy church or what kind of church are we looking for? A healthy church, and we need to be part of a church, Okay, there, there is no Lone Ranger Christian. That's what we see at, at, at this point in the book. Before I close the subject, Mark Dever makes um, a really strong point about the need. Uh, so I'm going to quote him here. He says on page 28, he says, We demonstrate to the world that we have been changed, not primarily because we memorize Bible verses, pray before meals, tie the portion of our income, and listen to Christian radio stations, but because we increasingly show a willingness to put up with, to forgive, and to even love a bunch of fellow sinners. Just like we do with our families, the church is a family. I I mean, think about what Jesus says when he says, Who are my mother and my brothers? All who obey or do the will of my Father in heaven are my mother and my brothers. He's making it clear that the church, we are all a family with each other. And so if you leave a church because somebody upset you, there's a problem. You don't leave your family because somebody upsets you. That, That would be ridiculous, right? And so the point is, we're a family, we're a community of redeemed people. Um, You know, in in fact, he says right here, he says, uh, right in the midst of a group of sinners who've committed to loving one another, it's there that the gospel is displayed. The church gives a visual presentation of the gospel when we forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us, when we commit to one another as Christ has committed to us, and when we lay down our lives for one another as Christ laid down his life for us. We are supposed to be imitators of Christ, right? While we are, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? Christ forgave us. And so when people leave churches, 
over petty reasons because they're offended by this person or they don't like what the preacher said. That's just really problematic. Okay, so I want you to think about that. Jesus loves a group of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. It manifests itself in local churches. He saves you. He puts you in one of those local churches. He died for that church. He died to to knock down all the barriers between people, right? And the barriers between us and God. He does this so that we could display the gospel to the world, right? Because then the world looks at us and sees how we love one another, how we endure with one another, how we forgive one another. So that's what the church is. That's what the church does. And then you leave a church because you don't like the music style. Because when you grew up, they sang out of a a book with the piano and these guys are using a guitar and and I, I just can't deal with that. How dare you? How dare you? You do not display the gospel at all when you have that kind of mentality towards the church. Remember what a Christian is, and then remember what a church is, the new covenant people of God bound and reconciled to God and to one another. And you're going to leave over preference, over what you want, over style, over how you feel? Man, it's not your church. It's his church. It's Jesus's bride, and we're all part of it you know, we who believe. And so that's just one implication. The church is a people. It is a people, a called out people. That's what the word ecclesia means, the called out ones, uh, related to the chosen ones, right? The the word ecclesia and eclectos, which is elect, they, they are related in, in the Greek, right? So we, we are the called out ones. We are those who are a peculiar people who belong to God, who are strangers and pilgrims in this world, according to the scriptures. We're supposed to be different. And so we're not supposed to to think like the world. Okay, so um, the last thing I'm going to talk about before we get into specifically what is a healthy church is in the last four lessons when I was talking about biblical theology, I spent a good deal of time about what the meta narrative of, of scripture is because the meta narrative, uh, the, 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 the story that unites all 66 books of the Bible tells you what the church is supposed to be and what it's supposed to reflect. See, the meta narrative is the story of God saving a people for himself through judgment, specifically the judgment of Christ, the Messiah, dying in our place. And throughout the whole meta narrative of scripture, God displays his holiness and his character and his love in saving a people, right? And so so the Father displays that throughout most of the pages of scripture. And then he sends his Son, Christ Jesus, God the Son. And Jesus then reflects the Father perfectly and displays that character, that holiness, and that love, and then saves a people for himself. And then Jesus says, As the Father sent me, I send you. So we too then are supposed to reflect the character and the holiness and the love of God, right? So you look at the the whole storyline of scripture and you kind of understand what the church is supposed to be and do. It's about God's character. It's about his holiness and it's about his love. It's about us reflecting that, living that out, promoting it. Uh, It's not about music. It's not about preference. It's not about felt needs. It's not about any of the consumer-driven ideas out there is not about seeker-sensitive. It is about the character and holiness and love of God because that is what we see throughout the whole meta narrative of Scripture that connects Genesis all the way to Revelation. And, and as we are, in a sense, an extension of Jesus in this world right now, we are his spiritual body. We are his hands and his feet. We are to reflect him as he reflected the Father. Okay, that is what the church is supposed to be like. And so because of that, we then, uh, in fact, let let me put it this way. I'm going to read page 48. He has a a really good uh, line that ends it, right? And so I figured this would be, uh, be perfect. Okay, so the question is, what should you be looking for in a church? Well, you should be looking for a group of pardoned rebels whom God wants to use to display his glory before all the heavenly hosts because they tell the truth about him and look increasingly just like him, holy, loving, and united. Okay, that is what you should be looking for in a church, a group of pardoned rebels that declares the truth about God and lives that out and are testifying to who God is, okay? So, 
That's what we're supposed to be looking for. So then the question is, what is a biblical and healthy church? It, it, you know, by this point, you're like, okay, I get it. I want to now be part of a healthy church. I, I, I hope I already am. So tell me, tell me what a healthy church is. Well, listen, myself or Mark Dever, we're not qualified to say what it is, but the Bible is. The Bible is God's book, series of books given to us that reveals himself and gives us the blueprint of what the church is supposed to be. And so... Mark Dever, by studying the scripture, has uh, identified nine marks or characteristics of a healthy church. Three of those marks are essential marks, meaning that if these marks are not there, you probably don't want to be at that church, okay? And then the, the remaining six marks are important marks. They're marks that a church should be striving over, but it's still possible to remain somewhere where maybe some of those, those other marks are missing, but you should strongly be encouraging those marks to be added. Now, I'm going to uh, say something that he doesn't say in his book. Uh, Wayne Grudem has a very helpful way of understanding this, right? You have false churches and true churches, okay? A false church is a church that rejects a major doctrine that if, if you reject one of those doctrines, you're not even saved, like Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, so forth. Um, you know, you think about it, they, they don't believe in the Trinity, they don't believe um, certain things that are just clear that you have to believe these to be a real Christian. Okay, so those are false churches or a church that gets the gospel wrong, right? You know, those are false churches. So we're not even talking about them. Then you have true churches. But among true churches, there's a spectrum. You have pure and impure. When we're talking about a healthy church, we're talking about churches that are more on the pure side, not the impure. And if you're at a church that is happy to be impure, even after you've tried to change it, you might want to consider leaving it. So when, when I'm going over these nine marks, understand to the degree that your church has these marks and, uh, you know, consistently displays them, then yeah, they'll be more on the pure end. But to the degree that your church doesn't have any of these, then to that degree, it's, it's impure. Um, and you probably want to look for a different church. So the first mark, the first essential mark is expositional preaching. My first three videos were about that. When I summarized Al Mohler's book, He Is Not Silent, right? Expositional preaching is a particular kind of preaching. Not all preaching is expositional, okay? Expositional preaching is where the sermons are derived from the text. A sermon seeks to explain and apply a text, you know, uh, in the life of the congregation, Okay, it's not where you start with the text and then talk about something else. No, the text directs the whole sermon. You say, hey, open up to this verse, you read it, and then the whole sermon is about that verse. What does it mean? What's it saying? What does it mean for me? Like, how am I supposed to apply this to my life? That's an expositional sermon. Exp expositional preaching uh, is led by the Bible. Okay, and expositional churches will be preaching from New Testament, Old Testament. They'll be preaching from letters, from gospel, from historical narrative to the Psalms, to the poetries, to the apocalypse. Because guess what? God has communicated his will to us in all 66 books of the Bible. Okay, so instead of topical series, expositional churches go through whole books of the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But not every verse by verse sermon is expositional. Okay, so again, the point of the sermon has to be the point of the text, and it has to be applied, you know, in, in our current context as well. That's what makes it expositional. Now listen, when you have expositional preaching, first off, the Bible is what determines the preaching content. Other models that you'll see are like topical preaching, where there'll be 20 to 30 minute topical sermons. Those aren't that biblical. Okay, what happens is the preacher, the human, is determining what you need to hear. If I'm, right now I'm taking my church through the book of Revelation, okay, the text itself determines what we're going to hear, not me, right? And, and if God gave us the Bible, then that is what, that's where we're going to hear of him. Not only that. When you do expositional preaching, the preacher is studying the original languages, the historical context. He is spending 10 to 20 hours per sermon studying it 
and writing it so that he could declare God's word to you. Let me tell you something. An expositional preacher is always learning. Every week, I'm learning things from the text that I did not know, that I didn't learn in seminary because I'm hitting it at such a depth. If you go to a church with topical preachers, you are never getting more than what the preacher knows because the preacher picks the topic. He then goes and finds verses out of context that he uses to support that topic. He's only telling you what he already knows. And I spent my first eight years at a church like that. And guess what? Every three years, the same sermon started repeating because he cycled through all of his topics and then started over thinking we would forget. Maybe some people did. But guess what? That preacher who preaches that same set, three-year set of sermons for his whole career as a preacher, he never learns. He never grows. Me, 10 years from now, I'm going to know a lot more than I know now because in that 10 years, I will have spent thousands of hours studying biblical text so that I could preach it to my people, right? For a church to be healthy, the preaching needs to be expositional. It needs to be the main diet of the church because that's where we're hearing from God and growing in God. And that's where we learn his character, his holiness, and his love. Okay, And so don't settle for non-expository preaching. When you look at the scripture, God creates by his word. He spoke the universe into existence by his word. He speaks spiritual life into us by his word. Okay, And so it's going to be through the preaching of his word that we rightly worship him by hearing from him and that, uh, that sinners get saved and that those who are saved grow. So expositional preaching is at the top of the list. Not all churches do this. In fact, very few churches do. Once you hear expositional preaching done right, you never want to go back to the, the other kind. I, I, that's the, at least my experience. The second biblical mark is biblical theology. Okay, by biblical theology, it, it means that our doctrines are derived from the scripture. And, and more specifically, you could go back to my four previous videos about it being the story that unites all 66 books and all the themes that we see in that. But Mark Dever's hitting it at a, more, uh, at a much simpler standpoint, right? Um, that biblical theology is we get our doctrines from the Bible. What is being preached needs to be in accordance with what the Bible says. Now, the whole narrative of scripture lets you know <clears throat> what verses mean. And so biblical theology is important because it, it makes it to where we have our doctrines rightly codified. And then when you look at a verse, you're not going to take it out of context and come away with some doctrine that, that can end up damning you, right? And so a church has to have its theology right. Now listen, there's a triage when it comes to a church's theology. What I mean is at the top, you have the first tier. These are the doctrines we all have to agree on. If you disagree on a tier one doctrine, you're not even a Christian. Those are the ones like the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, justification by faith, all, all that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> tier two <clears throat> are the things that, that you have to believe to do local church together. But it doesn't mean that somebody who disagrees isn't a Christian. Like, for example, Presbyterians believe in baptizing babies. We Baptists believe it has to be a believer's baptism, right? Well, we can't do church together because we'll disagree on who can take communion if we believe that baptized members take communion, right? So Presbyterians probably need to have their church. Baptists need to have theirs. We both see each other as Christians, but a tier two issue makes it to where we can't do local church together. Then tier three issues are the things we could disagree on and still do church together. Like, you know, timing of the rapture, right? Or is it uh, premillennialism or amillennialism? You could still do church together um, when, when you disagree on those, okay? So, so biblical theology is the idea that we get our doctrines from the scripture. We understand what are the non-negotiables and what are the negotiables. Okay, and that's clearly in a statement of faith. That way everybody knows what the church believes and what we subscribe to. And then the last thing I'll say about biblical theology is that biblical theology uh, also refers to the fact that we teach all the doctrines of scripture, all the verses of scripture. We, we don't 
avoid hard doctrines. Some churches will never preach on election, yet it's all over the scripture. Some churches will never talk about our, our need to be wise stewards and to give of our first fruits to God. They're afraid of offending people. Get out of those churches. Any pastor that thinks he knows more than the Holy Spirit, you shouldn't be under him. And what I mean by that is if a preacher is going to say, we don't address these particular subjects in our church. If the Bible addresses those subjects, the Holy Spirit and his infinite wisdom. Put that in the Bible because it's useful for you to learn. It's part of the all scripture that's breathed out by God that's useful for teaching, correcting, equipping, and and so forth, right? We have to address every subject in scripture. And when you preach through whole books of the Bible, guess what? You don't get to skip the hard ones. You have to preach on them. And by the way, when you come to the hard one, your people are going to know, well, he's not just, you know, let's say you're coming to a passage about giving to the church. Well, your people know that this isn't something that you're trying to manipulate them with. It's the text you just happened to land on. It was the next one right? And so you got to teach on the things that the Bible teaches on. It's that simple. So you have expositional preaching, theology that's derived from the Bible, biblical theology, and then the third essential mark is the gospel. You have to have the gospel right. Okay, if the church is all about self-esteem and making you feel good, uh, then, then something's wrong. Okay, the church should be about the gospel. Every sermon should have the gospel. Our songs should be showing the gospel. The way we we live and interact with each other should be showcasing the gospel of forgiveness, reconciliation, and love. Remember, your problem is not that you need more self-esteem, but that you're a sinner. Okay, that you're an idolater. And yet God, who justly could have condemned you, loved you so much that he came down and died for you on in your place on the cross, rose from the dead, and did all that so he could redeem you to himself, make you a new creation, grant you eternal life, and use you in the meantime to showcase his character, his holiness, and his love. Okay, that's the gospel. And that needs to be preached again and again and again, that you are not saved by your works. You're not, you bring nothing to the table that God needs from you. Okay, it's all of grace. It's all his gift. It's all from his love. And in the same way that he lavishes that love on us, we then, because we're redeemed, need to lavish that love on others. The gospel should dictate what what is preached, what's taught, how we live. Uh, I'm telling you, the gospel permeates everything Christians do. Not only that, the gospel is what unifies us to each other. Man, I've seen it where believers are unified over silly things like their their diets or their food allergies or whether or not they homeschool or whether or not, you know, all these things, like they're, they're, they're the same age as these other people. Yet what unifies us is the gospel. That's what Ephesians 2 says. It unifies people who are alienated from each other so that I could have true family fellowship with somebody who is nothing like me. That shows the gospel because God, who is entirely beyond us, has that fellowship with us. And so we should be reflecting that fellowship, and that is a matter of the gospel. The gospel is what unifies all of the different kinds of people of all the different generations, different walks of life in a single church. We shouldn't have segregated groups within churches. We shouldn't have cliques that all shows that walls are still up and that speaks against the gospel, right? So if the gospel is constantly preached and lived out and applied, you're going to have a healthy church. So that covers the three essential. Let me quickly go over the six important ones, important marks. Uh, You have to have a biblical understanding of conversion. Okay, conversion is the idea that you have to repent. You have to turn away from your sin and turn to Christ in, in faith. Okay, so it's repenting and believing. Now, it's God's work. He regenerates us. He gives us the new heart. He draws us to Christ, right? Um, and he calls us so that we can believe, but then we do believe and we have to turn away from our sin. See, a church that doesn't practice biblical conversion is going to have members that aren't really saved. Uh, too many of them. Okay, Just because somebody raised their hand and said a prayer doesn't mean anything. Have they turned away from their sins and have they truly surrendered and trusted and entrusted themselves to Jesus? That's biblical conversion. That needs to be... Uh, Uh, constantly taught and reminded in the church. Uh, That's a gateway for, for good membership.
Okay, then the next important mark is evangelism. We know what this means. The declaring of the gospel, of the good news to those who are lost. There should be a culture of evangelism. And again, when you understand what conversion is, you're going to evangelize, right? You're not just going to simply, um, you know, tell people if you add Jesus on top of everything else, you're going to be all right. No, if you understand conversion is turn away from your self-worship, stop relying on yourself, but rely only on Christ and give yourself to him, well, then you're evangelistic message is going to tell them that very thing. And you're also going to tell them to count the costs. You could care less about how many numbers you report to Lifeway each year. You'd rather want to make sure that these people understand uh, what it means to become a Christian. Jesus said, count the cost. You have to take up your cross and follow him. That's hardly ever said to people when we're trying to persuade them to become a follower of Christ. I always tell people that, listen, to be saved will cost you nothing But then once you are saved, it's going to cost you everything because you're not your own anymore. Uh, And so that that kind of stuff needs to be communicated. And there needs to be a culture of evangelism. And evangelism is not something that you, you don't evangelize with your example. You have to speak words. You have to speak the gospel. And a church that, that preaches the gospel every Sunday and trains its people up uh, to, to be gospel speakers to, to everybody they know, that, that's a sign of a, of a healthy church. Now, related to this is the next important mark, which is biblical membership. If you get conversion right and you get evangelism right, okay, because you got the gospel right, then biblical membership is going to be the idea that we only accept as members people who are actually saved, people who have actually converted because they really understand the gospel. You know, the first church I became a member of, all I had to do was fill out a card. It's ridiculous. And and now our church, we practice it the right way. We interview prospective members. We ask them, what is the gospel? If you are saved, you could tell me why you're saved, right? And you'll show that you understand the gospel and conversion, you know, and and all that kind of stuff, right? And so, so biblical membership is the idea that even though the Bible doesn't, doesn't say biblical membership per se, like we do it today, The Bible does show us that they knew who was part of the church, who wasn't. Somebody was counting in the book of Acts of how many were added. Paul knew, uh, Timothy knew when Paul wrote him who were the specific widows he was responsible for. He wasn't responsible for all widows. He was responsible for a particular list associated with this particular church. The way we can manage that wisely today is through a biblical process of membership. I'm not responsible for every Christian in this high desert. I am responsible for every Christian who is covenanted to this local church to be under the teaching of these pastors, to be under this statement of faith, to take the Lord's Supper with this group of people and to swear covenant and hold each other accountable, right? That's who I'm responsible to. That's who gets my my attention when it comes to counseling, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff, the shepherding, right? So biblical membership is a commitment, a commitment that I'm going to love you. I'm going to stir these people up to good works. Um, I'm going to let them hold me accountable. I'm going to hold them accountable. Um, that's biblical membership. You know, and, and the sad thing is a lot of churches, in fact, the average, I wrote it down, the average Southern Baptist church at least, um, For the average church, it has 233 members on the rolls, but only 70 people that show up any given Sunday. That's because they're not practicing membership right. Okay, when you practice it right, you only receive those as members who are real believers. And then if they move away or they stop coming, you know, you remove them off the membership roll. Now, if they don't move away and they're local and they just stop coming, you actually move into church discipline. They're in sin. See, the idea is... If somebody abandons the fellowship, you can no longer in good confidence say that I think this person's a Christian. You can't. You just can't. And so biblical membership is a church's affirmation that this person's a Christian. If a person is doing the exact opposite of what the Bible says, we can no longer in good confidence affirm that they're a Christian. But leaving them on our member roles is affirming they're a Christian, right? And so from that standpoint, we're actually being dishonest. We are saying something about somebody that we don't actually believe because they're not displaying the marks of a Christian at that point. So biblical membership is very important. A sign of a healthy church is when there are more people there on Sunday morning than there are members on the rolls, 
right? See, what normally happens is you have 300 people on the rolls and 100 people there. Far better to have 100 people on the rolls and then 150 people there because it means your actual members who have covenanted are coming and it means you're reaching the, the community to where more people are coming to hear the word of God preached. That's a sign of a healthy church, okay? And, and, and that's how, how you, you want to have it, okay? Um, just a couple more, okay? Um, church discipline, That's Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. Okay, Jesus commands us to to judge one another. Now, you might say, doesn't he say, do not judge? Yeah, he says, don't judge hypocritically. But then in the same gospel of Matthew, he says, if your brother sins, go confront him alone. And if he doesn't listen to you, take two more. If he doesn't listen to them, tell it to the whole church. If he doesn't listen to the church, then you expel him. You treat him like he's unsaved, a, a tax collector, right? Um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says the same thing. The majority of the church is supposed to expel the immoral brother. And then he says, you know, a little bit of leaven, which represents sin, will leaven the whole lump. Meaning God expects his church to reflect his holiness, his character, and his love. And it is not his holiness or his character or his love to allow unrepentant sin to continue within the body of Christ. So church discipline is a very important mark of of a healthy church. Very few churches do it today. I personally will not be a member of a church that does not practice church discipline. One, it's commanded. Two, the churches that don't do it have a whole bunch of uh, members that live exactly like the world and there's no consequence for it and so then it doesn't display God's holiness in his love and his character in fact the church is not functioning as as a church is supposed to okay church discipline is something churches are supposed to do now it's always out of love it's not supposed to be out of vengeance or anger Um, I always tell people that it's not so much discipline it's an attempt at reconciliation and only the people who refuse to reconcile because they refuse to repent they're the ones who get disciplined Okay, but this is a very important marker of the church. And then uh, the next one is biblical discipleship. Okay, the whole point of the church isn't to grow in numbers, it's to grow in holiness. And so does the church have things in place where people are growing in holiness, where you're teaching them, where discipleship's happening, where they're growing more and more to be like the Lord? What does it look like? You have more people volunteering on their own to start up new ministries that don't exist. You have people who check in on each other. You When, when a, a member's hurting, you have people who on their own, without the pastors directing them, uh, start coming up with food plans to help those people out, right? Right? It, it just it, it displays itself in the fact of maturity. The members themselves, without having to be told, start reflecting God's character, His holiness, and His love. And that only happens through intentional discipleship, where more mature Christians are pouring biblical knowledge and life skills into those who are, who are newer. And then they grow, and then those who grow now do that to the next group coming in. That That is what it would look like. And then the final one, the final mark is a plurality of elders. There's too many churches that are either run by deacons or churches that have a single pastor, but you don't find that in the Bible. In fact, in the New Testament, every church is run by a plurality of elders. The elders are equal. There's no hierarchy. Now, there might be a full-time guy who would be like the first among equals, kind of like Peter was among the apostles, but he doesn't have authority over them. He's just kind of the spokesperson. But when you look at how the New Testament is arranged, you have plural elders. You have a, a plurality of elders and then deacons who serve under the elders who meet uh, the physical needs of the church. And so, you know, should you leave a church that only has a single pastor? No. But what I'm saying is is they should be, because this is an important mark, not an essential mark, but they should be moving towards a biblical model of church leadership because there are so many benefits that come out of this plurality. You don't have the abuse of power. You, you have multiple people checking each other's authority. Uh, not only that, you, you just have, it, it slows down certain decisions that should be made slower. So, so many benefits that come out of um, plural eldership. And so pretty much that is this book. I, we've went over 120 pages and I know it's been 40 minutes. This is my longest video yet, but I decided to do a whole book. I, I thank you, all of you who made it to the end, right? Um, so so look, here's, here's what he finishes with in his conclusion. He says, healthy churches, churches that increasingly reflect the character of God as it has been revealed in his word, are not always the easiest places to be. 
The sermons might be long. That's true. If they're expositional, they usually will be, right? He says their expectations might be high. Yeah, because we're trying to model the character, holiness, and love of God. The talk of sin will feel overdone to many. The fellowship might even feel at least sometimes intrusive because we're family members, right? This is so different than what, what churches in America do. But this is the biblical model. He says, but the key word is increasingly. If we increasingly reflect God's character, then it stands to reason that aspects of our lives, both individually and corporately, um, that don't reflect his character, they will eventually start to reflect his character. This is how we grow. And it takes work. Okay? So, that concludes what is a healthy church. It only is fitting that next time... I will then talk about the companion piece, what is a healthy church member. So now that we know what a healthy church is, we're going to see what a healthy church member is. With that, thank you very much.